Hello and welcome to Babbles Travelling Yarns podcast. We've got a lot to go through today, like a lot to go through today. I was writing the show notes in bed this morning and I was like, oh my god, this is a lot. So let's kick it off. Who am I? I'm Grace. I am the babbler. I talk a lot. I make things with fibre, uh, all kinds of fibre, wool, flax, linen. I spin it. I buy it. I knit. I weave and now I sew my weaving, woven garments, which is great. I'm also kind of semi-designing, but not for anyone else, just for me. I, uh, I have said that I will publish patterns, but I haven't. I may have a pitch to send over to Knitterator though. So Knitterator is a very interesting um, program, which uh, allows you to input your own designs your own patterns into a um, a garment design. So um, the designer of the program, who is who goes as a iterator on Instagram, I met her at Edinburgh Yarn Festival last year. She's so lovely. But what you can do is you can buy, say, like a simple raglan top down sweater, but then you can actually integrate. Say if you have a book like this, A, ba a knitting stitch bible, any one of these, you can then integrate those patterns into your into this program, put in your details, measure yourself, and then you can make a beautiful bespoke sweater using her program. It's amazing. And I'm half thinking, because uh, the whole idea of um, designing a sweater, which I really want to do, I want to write up the pattern for a sweater I have designed for my colorwork sweater. I don't even have it here, do I? I think I wore it and it's gone somewhere now. But it's the grading. I don't have a clue how to do it. Um, but she's just designed this amazing program for a colorwork yoke um, pattern on Knitterator. So I was like, that could happen. So I might need to contact her and be like, hey, can we do deals? <laughs> This isn't how you do business. You're not supposed to do business on a podcast without even consulting the person. But anyway, I really recommend heading over to her program and to her website. And I'll put the details down below, even though I've written up my show notes already. Why do you always do this, Grace? You write up your show notes and then you don't follow them. Ugh. Anyway, she's fantastic. The idea is glorious. I love it. I'm drinking coffee out of a Remembrances Pottery mug, which she sent over to me. And there may be some secret collaborations happening for the new year. Just saying. Just saying. Shh, shh, don't tell anyone. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> okay, stop now, stop. So, let's concentrate. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram as Vanna Willemiel or Babbles Yarns. Mostly Vanna Willemiel. Um, I am... I do so many things. I dye yarn under Babbles Yarns on Etsy, but my shop is on hiatus at the moment because I am preparing for the Not at Rhinebeck online digital festival over Rhinebeck weekend. Um, so that will be from, I think it's like the 17th to the 21st of October. Um, I load a bunch of uh, beautiful makers organized by, it was all Natalie from Rem Remembrance's Pottery's idea actually. It was all her idea to, um, have it all set up and uh, do a whole kind of collaboration online just at that weekend. So I'm going to reopen my shop after Yarn Folk, after the summer, and that is going to be a big, big blowout sale. So oh, head over to, uh, head back down to my shop and favorite it so you'll be able to find it easily um, when the time comes when I open it. So exciting. So yes. So I've got a couple of um, autumn colorways in there already from when I dyed at Yarn Folk, but I am planning a couple more special things. Ah, so exciting. Um, right, so what else? Uh, I'm looking at my show notes over there on the computer, and that's why I'm looking over there. South. I am really excited about my retreat. The retreat is happening um, on the from the 27th, no, 26th to the 29th 
of October so it's like the bank holiday weekend um, in October I may have one room still available um, but if you want details on how to get how to get your little paws on that if you are free I'm still playing with my hair hey I'm playing with my hair Catherine <sighs> this is why I never have it down <laughs> so um, uh, yeah so if you want to find information on how you may get access to that room it is it I think it's a single triple room oh, sorry it's one bed in a triple bedroom um, so head over to my website and sign up to my newsletter and you'll be the first to hear about it when it goes live um, and when I decide what I'm gonna do with it I think that is happening I'm so I really should wait until things are finalized and like do a big announcement anyway so <laughs> but if you aren't available to come for the whole weekend there is an open day and it is completely free and you can come down to Ballyglass House on the 27th of October which is the Saturday if it's not the 27th I'm sorry but it's the Saturday of the bank holiday weekend and you can um, join in in our little makers market I'm gonna have a lot of my um, friends and people that I really admire I've I've requested for them to um, come and sell their beautiful wares in my in a little makers market at 12 o'clock on Saturday the 27th of October uh, it's free to attend it's free to come in and uh, yeah you can have lunch in the beautiful bar there there may be some um, uh, little talks given by the different dyers if they want to different dyers and makers just about who they are and how they how they started making and how important what kind of if it's how why it's important to them and um, then there will also be little looms set up. I'm going to rent a few looms from the guild and I'm going to set them up for people to have a go and see if you like them. Little rigid head looms and uh, also my spinning wheel and there will be some drop spindles as well uh, for people to have a go. So it's an open day where you can come and spend time with us and I'd love to see you there. Uh, it is about uh, 10 minutes outside Tipperary Town. You can get the train down from Dublin and get a taxi across. You can get a train up from Cork and get a taxi across. The taxi, it only takes like 10 minutes. I think it's like 12, 15, 15 euros, something like that. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, um, it'd be nice to get a couple of people over, uh, together maybe and come up for the day. It's a, it's a lovely area and I hope we get good weather, but sure, October, we can't really guarantee it. But either either way, there will be a lovely pub with a fire and there'll be a lovely lounge with um, lovely couches and people sitting around. So it'll be a lovely day. So, boohoo, great. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I have a epic along carrying on. So it's a, uh, it's a knit along for things that you find are epic to you. So something huge, like I particularly am knitting a sweater for my six foot eight boyfriend and it's kind of a slog. It reminds me of Brownberry's slog along challenge <laughs> where you just need to just keep going. Um, yeah. So if you're interested, pop over to the Ravelry group. There's details down below in how to look at that. And there's some incredible incredible projects going on there there's an amazing there's this gorgeous what the fade there's some beautiful hand spun hand knitted garments oh my gosh so gorgeous actually speaking of that I received a very special prize well actually she just gave it to me and I was like what are you doing and it's so beautiful and I love it so much but I feel like I am I'm a little bit project bag overwhelmed at the moment and I feel like I really want to thank everyone who's putting work into this epic along because you're really encouraging me to do it and you're creating these amazing projects. So I spent some time with Terry from My Cottage Number no. 9. I feel like this is going to be Terry from My Cottage Number no. 9's whole podcast because she's amazing and she's making the most incredible things at the moment and I spent the weekend with her and I love her so much so this bag oh my gosh so this bag is going to be in the epic along prize pool I love it so much there are bags like this this is a kind of she said it's the kind of the the small one it had it, she had a um the, the bags that are in the shop are slightly bigger than this one but it is beautiful it's 
beautiful. So it is a little bit um, smaller, but it, you can still carry like, these are other, other prizes for the Epic Along from the gorgeous Flourish Fibres. So this is going to be in the prize. These are all naturally dyed yarns from the Cotswolds in England. <gasps> naturally dyed, beautiful, beautiful superwash merino nylon. Oh, I love it so much. This is Summer Posy and this is Gunmetal and they're all naturally dyed. Anyway, so you can carry those two in there. I'd say you could probably put another skein in, well, you probably put your project in there then on top of that. But now I'm not going to pull the strings, but it is a pull tag. I can't do it because I'm going to be giving it away and the person who does it is the person who buys it or wins it is the only person who can pull the string tags. I learned that from Emerald Fibres. So I'll show you in my bag. So this is my bag of hers. These are Terry's um, amazing design called the wraparound bags. So you see there's like a there's a separate piece of fabric there and what that does is it's pretty magical so you pull the tags pull the and then you have a little handle it's amazing so sturdy like really really well made so terry has been sewing since she was like nine years old and she she's gone she's done dressmaking she's done uh different courses like she's done loads of different courses she's done curtain curtain making she's done bag making she's got really gone into the bag making now and especially project bag making but she's a wizard she's a wizard with the sewing machine and she's so much information about it all so she she uses really high quality sturdy fabrics you see that's kind of like a I don't even know the names but it's really sturdy woven kind of canvassy fabrics but with beautiful prints because she's got some gorgeous inside insider um what's the word sources for lovely 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 fabrics and I was in her little sewing cave and I may have uh, commissioned a bag from her beautiful fabric oh my god it's so gorgeous she has this new design out which is uh, similar to the wraparound design um, but it's a zipper it's a zipper design with the handles and she has these large ones which are basically sweater quantity bags and I need it for my epic along project because it's too big to fit into so yeah I've just outgrown and sadly I've just outgrown my emerald fibers um, machine embroidered bag <gasps> so it, it won't fit in here anymore so I get to use it for another project <gasps> So this is Emma Fibers bag and her handle design is like this and it's apps it's so comfortable as well. I just love all these creative sewists. Sewing to me is like a magical art that I haven't quite mastered because you've got to think about everything you do before you do it and every cut you make and every seam you sew is looking towards the end whereas I think I kind of like the methodical process of getting there and fudging it until it works at the end you know like knitting and weaving and things like that but it, once you cut fabric it's cut you can't go back so brave like to me it's like a <gasps> whereas with the iron you can always rip it back out again so just sewists are magical creatures Oh my gosh. Oh, she's got these lovely backpacks as well, the emerald fibres. She's got these gorgeous backpacks. So does Terry. Oh my gosh. But they're totally different design. It's amazing what different designers can do. They really create like such individual things. So this is going into the prize pool. Beautiful watercolour fabric. And this bag is available in her shop right now. Slightly bigger size. It's more at this size, which is actually lovely. So it's a little bit bigger, I think. I think now I don't. Sorry about that. If have a look at have a look at the um, dimensions on Terry's website. I just love it. It's got this. It's beautiful canvasy fabric, really hard wearing, and then this lovely kind of um, kind of splotch dyed purple, and she's got some beautiful oh world map bags as well. They're so cute. Have a look. It's just stunning, stunning stuff. Oh, look at the inside. Hang on. So you've got two pockets on one side and then this lovely little fabric on the inside. A little feather. I love that. I love that design. Oh, it's just, it's one pocket on the inside on this one. But she's such great photos as well. It's really clear to see. Anyway, Terry's podcast section one done. <laughs> 
So I'm going to put that in my precious podcast drawer, podcast prize drawer. Should we get on to the knitting? I think so. Yes. So, our, the, okay, I've actually combined everything into finished objects and works in progress and then things that I have acquired. Uh, so my knitting, weaving, spinning, everything has been piled into those categories so it's not separated out anymore. Um, just for this podcast um, and I'll see how we go from there. But I want to show off this big thing behind me so I'm going to move back the camera. <gasps> so this is my hand woven, no hand spun, hand woven, sewn garment. It is my coatigan. <laughs> so you might remember this from all over Instagram and the last two podcasts. I love, 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 love it. Can you see the whole length? It's so long. Oh, it just looks, I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of it. And I just love the way it just hangs straight down the front. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, so let's talk a bit about it. So this garment was hand spun from um, 450 grams, 450 grams of fiber, two gradient braids from the Irish fairy tale yarns, and then a 250, so that was the warp, all the way up and down, so that was the warp, um, which is the how the gradient comes across. So the warp was um, strung from my kitchen table to my bathroom door, and I hooked it around. I hooked it around this part, you know, it, so it came from here, and I hooked it around, um, which was great. There was no like the peg didn't pop off or anything because it was quite a heavy warp. So there was like, I think, fifteen foot in total by the end. Um, once it was taken off the loom, it was it shrank down to 14 and a half foot, um, which is fine. It's more than enough to do something with. To do this with. <gasps> I love it. I love it so much. I just love the colours as well. Mm. Um, and then I hand spun the weft, which was just one colour. Um, John Arbin. And this has been confirmed that this is blue spruce. This color is blue spruce. On the website, the color is a little bit more green, um, but this is blue spruce. Juliet from John Urban told me herself on Instagram, so. <laughs> but I absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, so this is the weft colorway, and it just went so perfectly with the gradient. It brings a kind of a life, like a, that under that undertow of blue that I wanted to bring through, because I was thinking about maybe putting a white through it. Um, like a white weft or a black weft, but the black weft tended to turn the white sections, those white sections, on my previous garment, it tended to turn it kind of grey. I love it, but it's just, I didn't really want, I wanted kind of a more luminous blue kind of wa wash underneath. It's it's really interesting the way colours play with weaving. Um, everything is so evenly, like, mixed that um, weaving tends to sadden down um, colours depending on what you put with it. So when you put a black with something, with something bright, what it can do is it can kind of tame that little, that, that bright colour, but it can also make it pop a little bit. But it does tame the overall colour to make it a bit more wearable for those of us that don't, that don't wear really bright colours, but who want to play with bright yarn. So it's really interesting. And then if you put white with something, it tends to pastel things. It tends to kind of fade it almost, um, which again makes all these bright colors really wearable. But I really wanted this kind of, I just, I just love it. It kind of added some sort of evenness and it did sadden the colors down a bit it kind of took the tone like the hue down a little bit from this bright kind of shine but it's just beautiful i love it now this uh braid is really interesting uh this fiber is really interesting it is falcon merino 
And then there's about 10% of Zwartbliss, which is a black sheep, so it's black fibre into this, which gives it this really amazing depth of colour um, into the sections here, which I really think helped this, um, kind of the mood of this kind of to, to settle down into something really, really just beautiful and mm, I don't, don't really know how to explain it. I just love it, you know? I just love it so much. So how did I make it? Okay, so the warp was in total 14 foot long. I'm gonna turn it inside out so you can see. It was 14 foot long. So what we did was we basically halved it and then quartered it. And we cut, we cut the piece into four pieces. Four pieces that were this long. And it was basically trying to get, we, this has not been cut apart from just straight across. So the whole piece has been cut into four pieces this long, which is just the, um, the amount of yarn you have, which is the, the length that I had. I just, I just quartered it. Then what we, we cut it by adding this interfacing. So this is, we were going to go for woven interfacing, but I didn't have time to go get it. So this is just um, kind of a firm, a firm pressed interfacing. Um, and it was ironed on and then cut and then I did a little zigzag stitch just to uh, hold the edges in place so it didn't fray. Now um, then what I did was we put everything on, we put it on to me backwards or inside out sorry and we pinned it So it was like this. So we're trying to sort out the fit and you basically put it on backwards and you pin all of your seams. So I had this part kind of sticking up and I, I decided that, well, uh, Terry helped me. I went over to Terry from Cottage Number no. 9 and I went into a beautiful sewing cave and we did all of this. So what we did was we, um, we sewed down, if you can see, there's a very small seam there and then we increased the seam to bring it out that way. But I didn't want to cut it. Just leave it, just leave it. Like an epaulette that'll be on the inside. So it kind of uh, adds a little bit of structure to the sleeve, which is great because I didn't want to cut it. But under here, if you have a little look, maybe on this side you might be able to see a little bit clearer. So on the sleeve, <laughs> it's getting dark here, but it comes, this is your, this is the sleeve here and it curves in and then down and out again. So it's just added a little bit of fitting around the bust area. Um, just to kind of bring it in slightly and then it goes down into um, like a half inch seam all the way down. Now what it's actually doing and I can see it here is it, it's actually folding here because we haven't cut. Sorry that was a little coffee burp. Mm. God it's hard to see. But there's this is the seam coming in here but it's folding up this way because we haven't cut it up here. What I think I'm going to do is get some more interfacing, get some of that woven good interfacing and iron it on this side and this side and cut it and sew it. Terry was scared to do that because I think, it, it, you know, it, it, it kind of would undo the structure a little bit if you're cutting it on the bias. I'm not sure how it would work. Um, but I feel like um, when the garment is on, it's folding under and it kind of doesn't give a nice clear line. Let me show you what I talk about. So you only really know about these things once you start wearing it, but I've been wearing it non-stop. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna work now at all, but. So if you see, it's kind of, it's not, it's kind of folded over there. Um, I think because I haven't, we haven't cut that, that piece of fabric. So yeah, just a little bit like, mm. it's the one thing about this that I'm kind of like, mm, maybe, maybe we should cut it. I know it's a bit scary, but if we interface it and then we sew it, I think it'll be fine. But it's a very sweet. So what I was going to do was add in a neck, so cut in a neck. But Terry was saying, actually, that's going to reduce down your sleeve to a little kind of very small sleeve. And you're not going to have that nice little, nice little cap sleeve. So I said, oh, yeah, that's a good point. So instead, what we did was we just made a little V-shaped neck there. 
and uh, that was it basically you just sew up the back to that that point and then that's it you just I might do a little fabric tag across there just to kind of I'm, I'm hoping to weave some woven bands and put a little fabric just a little glimpse of just a little sweet detail and then we hemmed the garment and the hemming is so pretty I was I was quite good I think we did it we added a little slit just because it's going down so low and there's a little hem there so we interface the bottom that there's interfacing in there if you can see it and uh, we turned it under and it just makes it feel like real fabric you know um, so that was actually just um, left so this is the width of the fabric and then was a little hem there where we just sewed it down and then carried on the hem all the way across all the way across the back so that's the back there just sewed together it's gorgeous I love it um, I've, I've written all the details of how of how it actually works um, in the show notes down below. Um, hi Beans. You want to be on screen? He's looking at stuff. He's looking at stuff. So what time is it? I've got to go to work at half twelve so. 10, 12. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday morning so that's grand. Coffee's going cold. No! So that is my first finished object. I'm loving it. I can't believe it. I've hand spun it, hand woven it, and then sewed it myself. I made this from fluff. The only thing I didn't do was dye the yarn <laughs> or dye the fiber. Dang it. Next time, next time. <laughs> but um, beans and scratching stuff, but that's okay. So the next project, oh, I just want to say thank you so much to all the love that it's getting on Instagram. It's like, I can't stop sharing it and everyone loves it and I'm just like so proud, so proud of myself. <sighs> so I'm just fixing my hair. You gotta do it. I'm sorry Catherine. When it's down I have to fix it. But I finished another piece. I finished my antler hat. <gasps> so this is the antler hat by Tin Can Knits and this is using uh, um this is the Moon and Sixpence yarn, Annie, down in Cork. So she is really getting into natural dyeing at the moment and I'm loving seeing all the stuff she's making. I decided to use as much yarn as possible with this. Beans. He's playing around on the... He loves paper. Hey Beans. Hey Beans, what you doing? Are you trying to get in? He's trying to get in the bag. You're really not supposed to get in that bag. <gasps> oh my god. <clears throat> get out. Get out of here. So this hat is made from the Moon and Sixpence um, organic DK weight yarn, merino, 100% merino, and this is dyed with avocado pits. She's really getting into natural dyeing at the moment. I'm loving seeing all of her natural dye experiments on Instagram. She's getting some gorgeous colours. So this, I wanted to use as much as possible of it. So I actually made a double brim. So this brim is twice as wide and then I folded it under and picked up all the stitches. Um, I, I kind of knitted them together you know, if you know what I mean. I knitted the stitches together and then carried on with the pattern. So the pattern, I think I did, I didn't do as many as the pattern requested. I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I did seven. I did seven repeats before um, decrease, starting the decreases. The decreases are so pretty though. I don't know if you can see it. That is so cute. Can you see it? Can you see it? It's just lovely. It's a lovely hat. I did have to knit the biggest size. I started off on the medium size thinking I'd be fine. Uh, totally wasn't. Um, so this is a small hat. This is the largest size and it fits my head. My head is big but it's not the biggest. Like it's not my dad's size head or my or my boyfriend's um, 
size head and they have large heads so um, I would just be aware of that if you're thinking about knitting this maybe go up to maybe it was for a worsted weight yarn or iron weight yarn or something um, and a bigger needle size but I can't remember so <laughs> so that is the antler hat it's a gorgeous flute the yarn is beautiful the stitch definition on that is amazing I love it so much and it's this beautiful shade of pink so I think this might be a, a little Christmas present going to somebody but it's really sweet so that is that so um I have been working on something oh yes okay so let's talk about the my works in progress now that let's talk about my epic along sweater for James this is I took it off the needles I blocked it and it's big enough I don't have to steak it yay I know some of you are really interested in seeing me steak it I'm glad I don't have to because um it's like extra things that I don't want to do um so but I wouldn't have a problem steaking it there's a lot of steaking videos going on online so um yeah so I don't have to do it hooray it fits him um so it's the oh gosh the pattern is so pretty now it's blocked out I really really thought that it wouldn't because cables is essentially ribbing it's knits and pearls beside each other in long lines so I really thought it would just suck in but blocking 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 so I took the needles off I finished this is actually two full balls of um, yarn I've got the next one to go this is um, Kerry Woolen Mills yarn this is the size of the ball this is my head if you've met me in real life this is a large large ball needs two hands to hold it and this is the third ball so it's 200 grams of 100% wool basically um, uh, milled in Ireland so this is two of these and it's done the body for James's sweater now I've been trying to get a good photo of James in this but it kind of looks like a girdle I'll put it up anyway at some point but <laughs> I need to get a better photo of him <laughs> so it works it works now I don't know where to go from here. <sighs> so I need to work out which sleeves I'm going to do. Now I had so many people send me lots of information, but it was all sent to me in different avenues, like Instagram, Messenger, d DMs, um, comments under videos that I can't really remember which video it was on. Um, so I'm going to ask you a favour. If you sent me more information on uh, different types of sleeves to go with this, a lot of people were talking about saddle, saddle shoulder, um, which sounds really interesting. Now, there was a couple of links that people sent me, but of course I didn't save them or put them, you know, anywhere useful. But if you did send me something, could I ask you a huge favour and send me an email with the details? Um, because then I won't lose it. Um, you can send me an email or a Ravelry message actually. Ravelry is really good for searching as well because that you can search your inbox then. So my email is grace at babblestravelingyarns.com and my, I'm Vanna Willemiel on Ravelry. But I really would appreciate it uh, if you have any information on um, maybe saddle shoulders or s another sleeve um, kind of, I mean, I could do raglan and go up and in um, or I could just keep going straight up and just pick up stitches and do a drop shoulder. But I think I really want to do this pattern. I think I really like the idea of doing the pattern all the way down from the sleeves. But do you have to knit those sleeves separately and then like seam everything together? Um, I've never really done that. Um, so I would, l I, kn I know loads of people have sent me stuff already and I hope you're not sick of me, but I really would appreciate if you could email or Ravelry message them because I can't find the information anymore. Um, I know this sounds like really, oh my God, I am too popular. There's too many people are messaging me, but oh my God, my DMs are just full. Okay. I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. That sounds really, yeah. But I can't find them. I can't find the information because I've had lots of little... Because I'm always on stories and stuff. And people reply to those with just like little smiley faces or highs or happies. And they kind of 
it, it the information ones kind of drop off and I haven't saved them because I'm an idiot so <clears throat> if you've got any ideas um send me an email and I'll pop the email address down below as well but it's basically grace at babstoppingarrows.com I would love you forever if you did that because I think we all want to see this done don't we team babbles we can do this together yay <laughs> so um it's a blanket now like it's a you know you can fold it so much isn't it pretty so yeah I'm so proud of myself that I managed to get the gauge right. The gauge swatch did not lie. I was just not trusting the gauge swatch because I was knitting it and it was all kind of like, Whoop! and I was like, this is never gonna fit him. And then I block it and I'm like, oh my God, I blocked my swatch. I was right. Oh my God. Anyway, so <clears throat> that is the next step on that. I think I'm gonna have to hold off on that for a while because on Friday I'm leaving to go on a cruise a cruise in Greece um, we're going to a couple of different Greek islands I probably am not going to be posting as regularly on Instagram um, because I'm going to be on holiday with my family but I have no idea what to bring I was half thinking about bringing some crochet and some cotton and doing maybe a virus shawl um, or I might um, carry on with a few socks or stuff that I have. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about what I have been working on. So I have not cast on anything new. <gasps> I know, it's crazy. Because I'm just trying to work through a couple of things. So I've got a kind of a slow project that's kind of easy and I pick up every so often. It's The Hitchhiker by Martina Bem. And oh my goodness, I've dropped a stitch. Oh my goodness, great. Um, so it's a very easy pattern, very easy, simple, um, which way I'm supposed to go with that? This one, I think. Yeah, that looks better. So, um, this is the Hitchhiker by Martina Bem. I'm in the middle of a row. How can I be in the middle of a row? The rows are only like 20 centimeters thick. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> How did this happen? And there. So this is some yarn that I got at 2017 Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I bumped into Nora George Yarns and I kind of just discovered her and I saw her in the queue and I literally just screamed in her face. And then she gave me some yarn. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that because I've just been so rude. I was like, Tracy! She was like, oh my God. So that was really, really awesome. So this is the Edinburgh Yarn Festival 2017 colorway called Thistle and it is a, a uh, my one was a tweed colorway and I'm just doing um, the Hitchhiker shawl, just a one skein shawl, um, just with little edges on the back. I think I've got it kind of sorted. I'm doing a little trick um, which was told to me and I, I can't show it to you now because I've just taken out the marker. Dang! So, yes, that's annoying. Maybe I could go to this end and show you what I'm do gonna do. Yeah, so I, I heard about this trick um, from somebody, I have no idea who, but it involves putting in a stitch marker um, at the start of when you, so the hitchhiker basically goes on the premise of knitting a certain rows, increasing on one side and then, um, casting off a certain amount of stitches every every whatever number um, of rows. It is a paid for pattern so I don't want to give your num give the numbers away or anything like that but um, what I did see was a putting a stitch marker in when you had just so I have just cast off if you see there I have cast off just here so this is the row that I'm going to put in a stitch marker because it's kind of starting the whole repeat again. So I'm going to put in a stitch marker at the end of this row where I'm increasing. So in between the two increased stitches, um, just right at the end, I'm going to pop in a stitch marker. And then every row you do extra onto that, you're always increasing at the end. So the stitch marker moves in the number of rows that you have knit. So say it's, we're, we'll pick a round, like, like, 20 it's not 20 but say you need to knit 20 rows 
you will have increased 20 times and then your marker will have 20 stitches on this side of it. So you will know, okay, once you hit 20, I can go back the other way and then cast off. And then I start again, take out the marker, pop it in um, again at the start of your repeat and do another 20 rows or whatever. Um, they'd be some huge wedges, but anyway. So that is the trick that I've been using with this and it's great. So I'm nearly to the end and we'll start talking about it. I'm using, I'm knitting it in Terry's Christmas bag that she gave me this year. She's got some gorgeous Christmas fabric that I've seen. Oh my gosh, it's so cute. <gasps> Here we go with Terry's stuff again. Okay, so I'm so I'm on the last stitch here, and this is where I'm going to increase. So I'm going to get my little marker. I have my little marker here. It's a beautiful marker given to me by my lovely friend Marion, Marion Prince. I love it. And I'm going to do my increase and then put that marker in between the two stitches. So that one stitch has now become two stitches. You see? So that one stitch has become two stitches. I increase there in the middle. And then every time I go every row, I will then have an extra stitch at the end. Yay! It's great! Um, yeah. I love that idea because it keeps, I'm able to keep track of it because I take this to knit night, I take this into work. I've just been knitting on it here and there. It's kind of, it's a very slow kind of project um, just because the way I'm knitting it, I'm just not really thinking about it too much. But it's nice, my slog, slog along, slog along. So that was fun. Uh, then, um, so I have cast on a pair of socks and they're basically only for cinnamon knitting because there's nothing worse than not having a sock or something really plain and in the round for cinnamon knitting, like a hat or whatever. So I decided to cast on the sock ages ago and like leave it as my cinnamon knitting. So we went to the cinema there last night and it was, we went to see, um, what was the film called? Uh, Black 47. So let's talk about the knitting first and then I can talk about the film because it's a really important film. Um, so this is, this is yarn from Gamer Crafting. I bought it in woolen and it is the Darth Vader colorway. I love it. James picked it out um, because he, and he wanted socks. So they're, they're his socks. So it's a 72 stitch sock all the way around. I did a two by two rib, really simple rib. And it's, um, it's starting to pull, which I love because it's kind of like, it's, been slashed in the leg by a lightsaber you know what I mean I love it love it so this is a 72 stitch sock so this yarn won't always pull in this direction you know everyone's tension is different and with different gauges and everything so on one side it's kind of Dennis the menacing up <laughs> and then on the other side it's kind of like slash pooling so that's really cool <coughs> so I need a couple of rows in there in the cinema um, I probably had only, I probably knit probably two inches on both socks, which is four inches on one sock, so that's good. So the film uh, Black 47 is the first film, the first major feature film um, that I know of, that I've heard of, that um, to which is about the Irish famine. So uh, in 1847, it was the worst year of the Irish famine. The potatoes had uh, failed three, two or three years in a row, which meant that nobody had any food left. There was nothing saved. Um, so the first year it happened, it was bad, but they could survive and they were depending on the next crop. Then it failed again and then it failed again. And it was just kind of horrendous. Um, 
it's kind of really personal. God, I don't know why I'm getting so emotional about it, but I mean, it happened 170 years ago, but it's taken 170 years for it to be documented. Not documented, like obviously it's been documented and books written about it and everything, but like documented in popular theater and film in, in like a, in a, in a film that, um, it's an interesting film. It's actually along the style of a Western, like a traditional Western. So it's set in West Connemara, which is the West of Ireland, which is the West of Europe, which is the West of the English kind of, it was real rugged country. You know, it was, it was rough, it was mountainous. It was full of peasants and the Aboriginals. The Irish were called Aboriginals because that's the way English people thought, you know, the, the, the English elite um, thought of everything else. There were peasants, there were natives, there were Aboriginals, you know, there were less than, less than. So um, the whole idea is that um, Ireland was under English rule. It was part of the United Kingdom, it was part of the Commonwealth and the whole of Ireland now, this is the whole of Ireland. Um, so uh, the a lot of people went and a lot of men used to go and the only way you could get money really or get a career was take the king's shilling which was taking the um going joining the army and traveling around with the army so it's based on this one man who came back from the army back home when he heard about all the horrible things that had happened in ireland and the, the horrendous famine that was happening and it's his revenge story for what happened to his family but it really talks about it really so let me give you a little personal example I worked in England for about three years and I I, I lived in Scotland and then I worked, moved down to England and I worked in England for about three years and I was the only Irish person um, living in or working in uh, the hospital in um, the southwest uh, just this particular this particular department sorry it was only in the x-ray department that I was working there and anytime I would say the word potato they would laugh at me because it's like a funny Irish thing for me to say potato 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 but the reason that the word potato is associated with Irish people is because of the horrendous suffering that it caused and there was a scene in the film where this English kind of officer was going to kind of track down this soldier and um, kind of get him in. And it was basically, he was saying, well, it's the Irish people's fault for only planting one crop. It's their fault. You know, you reap what you sow. They're idiots. But the thing was, they were, they were in such dire poverty and they didn't own their own land. They rented the land off of the... The, the landlords, the, the English landlords. I mean, it was their land all along. The English came over in, during the 1700s and, and took the land as plantations. They said, this is ours now. And the Irish people were like, what? Oh, okay, got to deal with this. They've got the guns. And so they actually turned in, turned from owning the land to being land, own, land tenants and they would work the land for the Lord. So they were only allowed this tiny little field next door to their house to grow all of their own food while they worked on the hand. So the biggest crop that you could get out of a small yield um, to feed a big family, because of course it was a Catholic country, so there was no, and also it was like 1800, so it was no contraceptive anyway. So um, for big families in those days, um, the only crop, the biggest crop you could get, the biggest yield to feed a family in a small area was the potato. And there was only one uh, breed available at the time. So are only one breed available to the Irish. So when that crop got um, infected by a virus, by the blight, uh, then everything, everything collapsed. Um, all of the peasants basically died. Not really, but all of their crops died. And um, then there was something called the poor tax introduced, where the landlords had to pay a tax for every poor person, person in poverty on the lands. So some of the landlords went into went into bankruptcy trying to save, trying to help these the the 
their own their tenants you know trying to help these people some of them did but a l some of them didn't and some of them didn't want to pay tax for poor people who couldn't work because they were too poor or, you know who couldn't who couldn't um give back to them who weren't any value to them so basically what they did was they went and evicted they would tear down the houses of the poor people to get them off their land so they wouldn't have to pay the poor tax so the landlords wouldn't have to pay the poor tax so um people were evicted thrown out and then they died they either took everything they had and went to England or America where they were also treated as crap. So um, yeah, so this film really like, uh, it was very kind of like my father was saying that, you know, oh, you know, a lot of the landlords weren't that bad and, you know, uh, things like that. And it's like, yes, but a lot were that bad as well because it was all about money. And most of the landlords weren't even in Ireland. They were actually, li they lived in London and they would come over to um, take the crops. Um, so such as grain, they were growing loads of grain. I mean, Irishism, Ireland is the most fertile country. It's like a really, really fertile country. It's not the most, but it's a really fertile country. It can grow anything, cows, cattle, beef, pigs. Um, it can grow f lots of grains, um, maize, corn, oats, everything. But um, they were all being grown by the landlords to be sold to England. So all of that, all of that grain was being taken out of the country while the people were starving. So if you ever hear a person say, an Irish person say potato because they're going to have, go home, put on the potatoes, don't laugh at them, please. <laughs> because it was the downfall of our nation and it was incredibly, it was, it was a genocide and um, it's not funny. The film is fantastic, it's a real kind of moody, the scenery is gorgeous, it's very sad, very sad. If you're interested in knowing more about the famine, I, like historically I think they shoved a load of stuff in you know to, to really tell the story and it does tell a story in a concise kind of way um, but um, they also speak Irish all the way through it and the Irish is subtitled but I actually love it because they talk a lot about um, the the English people wouldn't speak Irish. They wouldn't learn Irish. They'd be like, oh, you know how to speak Irish. You know English. Why can't you speak it? And then they would get suff They would get punished and sent to Van Diemen's land for being up in court because they wouldn't speak English because they couldn't speak English. So they would get sent to Tasmania. But I did a vlog about Tasmania actually um, a couple of days ago. So they were that they mentioned that like, oh, you know, this man was um, arrested for stealing a sheep uh, for his family to eat and he got sentenced to 12 months hard labour and then seven years transportation to Australia for trying to feed his family you know yeah and it took 170 years for a film to be made out of this you know but anyway sorry super emotional but I really recommend going to see it if you don't know anything about the Irish famine um, and you don't understand because I, I lived in England and I lived in Scotland and the amount of people that didn't have a clue about the Irish famine and they were complete denial when I told them about it they were like no that never happened no we'd never do that you're like no no it wasn't you it was the English elite at the time did it but it's this colonial idea that the aboriginals aren't worth anything and they need to be got rid of because they're annoying us with their you know, needing to eat and feed their families. Ugh, so annoying. So yes, that was interesting. Um, I've not finished. <laughs> Why did I go with that? Oh, it was the sock. Oh yeah, that sock. Sorry. But that sock is really, was really useful for the cinema. Oh, oh, oh. But I really recommend going to see that film. It's a very interesting film if you don't know anything about the, um, the famine or if you are interested in the famine you do know about the famine and you'd like to have a little look at it and see um, what it was like because you can still to this day see all of these cottages that have been torn down um, and people evicted from them you can still see a ton of them they're just everywhere all over the country just these ruined tiny houses that um, were taken from the poor 
talk about some spinning. <laughs> so I have gotten really far on my spinning journeys. So um, I have 300 grams of this Hello Yarn Fibre Club which I'm working my way through. This is the Ships, Whales and Iceberg limited edition American wool blend top hand wash uh, four ounce um, bump. So I've got, what's four by three? 12 ounces? So I've got 12 ounces. So the first one I did was this one. So this was a fractal ply and then this was the leftover two ply then that I took off of the other side of the bobbin. So um, it doesn't exactly match the fractal ply. If you're interested in hearing about the fractal ply, go back to the uh, last video and I'll speak all about it. But I just finished my most recent one. This is a lot tighter, oh gosh. So they're quite similar. I think I'll get away with it. They're both spun in the same way, but I think one, I think this one is slightly chunkier than this one. Big rant, big rant. And then I managed to kind of split the braids a little bit more evenly on this one. This is the one, this is what I had left over from the plying. So that was great. Um, I haven't really gotten, I haven't really got start my teeth into this one yet. I'm kind of, I was kind of a bit color weighed out. So um, I've started something else, um, which I'll share in another video. But I'm really getting into my ply on the fly. So this is my ply on the fly. I've kept it in a, um, a kind of a Ziploc plastic bag because um, I want the fibres to stay as smooth as possible. So um, this is my ply on the fly and I'm making a pretty cop. See, I put it up as cop somewhere and they were all like, I think it's cop. And I was like, oh, I didn't think it was cop because it sounds like a police officer. But anyway, so this is my ply on the fly. Now, what is ply on the fly? I spoke about it last time, but um, essentially I am spinning up the yarn just here. I'm spinning up the single on the top and then I am winding it off onto my hand. Uh, once I get it here. I like to tuck it into my watch band. I've just tucked it into my watch band there and I'm just going to wind it around the back of my thumb, back of my palm, back of my thumb, back of my palm, back of my thumb, back of my palm. So it's a figure of eight. So it's basically just so it won't, um, it's kind of like a Navajo Navajo bracelet, I suppose. Except I can never remember it, so I just have invented this one, which suits me. Now, this is coming off, which is annoying, so you have to kind of keep that. I kind of wish I had a little notch. I might get a little notch chopped in to hold that little um, part. I'll show you why that's coming up now in a moment. Once I get all of this off. Oh, that's so you know what I might do? I've seen someone with a hair clip actually put a hair clip onto her ball of yarn and I think I could probably do that here. It would hold it nice and still. I don't know if I have a hair clip. Oh, that's very annoying. Oh, I don't have one here, but... Finding my loop from the last time. Hopefully I'll zoom in about now. So I had it I had it wrapped around the, the top of the spindle, holding it in place, but um, I'll just take it off now. Just pop it in between my legs so it stays nice and still. And now I'm just going to take it through like a crochet chain. 
Now you can do the crochet chain in a big long loop. Um, I just find it handy to, to do it this way. And then you spin it anti-clockwise because the um, because the um, what's the word the single was spun clockwise so someone was asking me um, is there a problem with um, not letting the singles rest before you ply them and I hadn't noticed I don't know because this is the first time I've done this but I don't think so. Um, I've been following this uh, guy called Ken Main on Instagram and following his ply on the fly journey. And it's really fun because he's now knitting with it and it's gorgeous. I'm gonna just let it fall so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just taking that loop, popping my hand through it and then letting go. And then spinning this anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise. Now that probably looked clockwise to you, unless it switches. I can never remember which way the screen goes, but anyway. And then to wind this cop. So the idea of winding the cop is to try and maintain the yarn around it evenly. Um, but also it's so pretty and satisfying. Um, a lot of ply on the fly is done in a Turkish spindle. Um, so I was like, oh, I want to make it. I don't have a Turkish spindle that that spins nicely. I have a kind of a Turkish spindle um, but it's very big um, and I want a small little one so I'm on the hunt for a small little Turkish spindle. Now just winding it around the hook there just to catch it for sturdiness sake to wind this down and up Down again. So now we're moving into the red. We've kind of come from this orange to a peachy to a red. I can't wait to see what this is. So this is going to really come up self striping, hopefully. They're probably only going to be quite thin stripes because I have split the braid into about eight different sections. So it's probably going to be thin stripes, but I'm okay with that. I'm going to just wrap that around a couple of times and pop the loop on. Now, yeah. and I'm going to get a little, um, do you know those little clippy braids and pop it on? So that is my little ply on the fly. That's how far I've gone. So that's cool. I have done probably two braids or two two little strips on that so far. So. So what else have I got to talk about? Oh goodness gracious. Okay, so I just want to talk about something very special. So I had spoken to um, Terry about uh, Amy from Stranded Dye Works has this beautiful pennant on the back of her podcast and it's where she keeps all of her pins and I spoke to Terry and I was like oh that looks amazing and then of course Terry then went away and she made one for me so this is pin pennant hashtag pin pennant and it's a, I know I have more pins on loads of bags but I'm going to collect them all on here it's a lovely way to have them all because on I switch bags all the time I never really have the one bag so it's really nice and I have like all of my friends from Edinburgh Yarn Festival and then Atlantic Nitsky Sad Paca from um um La Bienna May, they had Sad Paca there, it's Curious Handmade, Mecca Mika, Julian It's in Paris, <gasps> uh, Pomcast, <gasps> this is um, Jenny from Lone Large, uh, Nitography Patricia, P4 Chen, 
Kate from Hawthorne Cottage Craft. Rip, Eric gave me this. That was really sweet. Hey Brownberry hugged me in 2018. Oh, and Hey Brownberry made this first one for me, my first pin for me. Babbles Travelling Yarns. I'll never forget that. That's so sweet. John Arbin pin, because I'm a member. Uh, Tipsy Knits, Tipsy Knits, the best audio podcast. Um, then who's that? Happy Knitting from Moods of Colours. Oh yes. Yarnesty. I can't find your pin. I've lost it. Huh? I haven't. It's somewhere, but it's in the bottom of a bag. Yarnesty, which is my friend Anna. Oh, my friend Deanne sent me these and I finally have somewhere cool to put them. So it says, I will tolerate most anything if you let me knit at the same time. Correct. And then I don't have a knitting problem. I can stop after this row. Thanks, Deanne. And then these are my kind of enamel pin ones. So that's my own one. That's Townhouse Yarns, Little Grey Girl, Bear and Sheep's Clothing, Ninja Chickens. Oh, somebody gave me this and I can't remember who. And it's just a little hairy coo and I love him so much. Um, this is um, from Maker's Merch. I'm a member of the Maker community. Perth Yarn Fest. Uh, Le Bien Aimé, her beautiful sheep. And then this beautiful sweater I got in Paris at the same time that I went to Le Bien Aimé. So Terry's offering these in her shop. It's so exciting. And she actually will um, personalise them with your own little name. It's the sweetest thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's so sturdy so she has interfaced the fabric so she's got this really sturdy canvas and then she's interfaced the fabric and she has the backing as well um it's really easy to get your pins through i just pop them through there and the actual the other pins don't even come through because you just go through the first the first level and then there's a lovely ribbon she'd probably adjust the ribbons but if you're looking for somewhere to keep all of your pins i like to i like to hang it up just about here and it's like a piece of artwork. Well, this is normally where I keep my sock blockers, but it's just, it goes with this kind of color actually as well. So I'm gonna, I'm probably going to pop a, a little pin just here and have it hanging underneath my hair from when I, from I won, when I won at Atlantic Knitscape. So I just, ugh, I love it. But in, and uh, for the moment, I'm going to pop it just behind my backdrop there. So we can all see it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Terry. I really like, you're a wizard. She meant anything I need sewn. <laughs> she just, she's amazing. So yes, she is offering it in her shop and her shop is My Cottage number nine on Etsy. So if you're interested in getting your own, pop straight over there, the link is in the down bar. Pin penance forever. All right. So we're probably at time now. That's what I'm thinking. Um, I just want to speak a little bit about some advent calendars, which I may or may not have purchased. I did. I did it. It's fine. I work hard and I love creating things and I will use everything. So I went ahead and I bought the beautiful advent calendar by a Flourish Fibres, who is the girl who sent me um, the sample of yarn uh, for the giveaway. So I bought an advent calendar from her. So, oh, I'm so excited. So it's going to be um, all naturally dyed fibres, naturally dyed yarn. So that's going to be my yarn calendar. And I'm hopefully going to make something like the Land of Sweets um, cowl from Curious Handmade, where she actually combines all of the all of the little mini skeins into it. That'll be a lovely project to, to keep going. I also bought Flora Fibers. Is a she's a kind of um she's a vegan uh, crafter. So she actually has lots of plant based um, yarns. But I bought her Spinners Calendar because I've wanted to sample loads of different types of. Uh, plant-based yarn or flat plant-based fiber for spinning for ages and I just never kind of got my guts to do it but she's offering basically her whole like all of her um samples she's I think she's doing I think it's 12 different types of fiber and she's doing 22 different samples and then you get a set of Rolex and a, and a bat as well so I've bought that for myself as well so nice. 
So that's going to be really, really interesting. And then I'll have this huge sample of uh, so to test um, all the different types of yarns. So I'm so excited. So that's Floor Fibres and Flourish Fibres. I feel like they're very similar names. But they're... Um, so all of Flourish Flora Fibres are naturally dyed as well. And they're vegan yarn. Uh, yeah, vegan yarn and fibres. So like there's banana, um, linens, um, sea cell, soy, soy milk fibres, I think. I think it's just soy fibres. All these different fibres I've never heard. They're so interesting. So I'm going to give that a go. So excited. So this is the first like proper advent calendar that I've bought. I received a beautiful kind of mid-year advent calendar from my lovely friend Carmen because I love her so much. Um, but this is my first one that I bought for me. So it's great. So if, you, if you're interested in anything like that, I really recommend you head over, have a little look and see what they do, see if you fancy it yourself. And I, I did hear that I, so I put the shout out because I've kind of been on a yarn dyeing ban because I went over my budget and I started looking at my bank accounts and seeing where all my money went and it all goes on yarn. <laughs> but um, I was speaking to someone and she was like, yeah, but you love it. Like you really get such joy out of um, creating yarn and creating beautiful products from your yarn there's no reason why you're not like you're not wasting it you know you're really not it's you're you're getting such value out of it you're living your life this is your passion there's no reason that you can't spend money on it because you're also paying your I'm paying my bills I'm still saving uh like the, I'm not going into debt um buying yarn it's I'm I'm loving I'm loving everything I buy so she was, because I kind of get this bit of anxiety, I'm sure everybody does, about like, oh, I shouldn't be spending money on this. It's frivolous. It's not necessary. But at the same time, like, life is for living and you can't take your money with you. And I could die tomorrow, God forbid. But I could, uh, you know, a meteor could fall from the sky, you know. And uh, if it does, I promise you can have my yarn. <laughs> Nobody knows who it was. <laughs> you can all fight over it. Yay, drama! <laughs> but um, I think it was really interesting. She was like, instead of feeling stress and worry when you buy yarn, just kind of project a little bit of, oh gosh, I'm so happy that I have this abundance that I can buy this yarn. Kind of express gratitude for your hard work and your bank account for being able to take this hit, like express gratitude for, oh, I'm so glad I'm buying this. It's so beautiful. I've worked so hard for this, you know, and I'm so grateful for this abundance that I can, I can buy. And I was like, that's a really nice way to think about it because I get really anxious about not feeling worth. Like sometimes I feel like I'm not worth spending money on especially to myself. I feel like, no, Grace, you don't deserve it. But actually, I work my arse off. So I do. And I enjoy it. And I love sharing it with you. I love making things. And I love talking about it and talking about designers that I love and makers that I love. And that's not a bad thing at all. It's all lovely. So I meant to do a review, a book review, but it's, this has gone on too long. So I might do a separate book review. Um, it's on the book um, by uh, Carol Feller, who has brought together a number of designers for the Echoes of Heather and Stone. I've shown you a few pictures beforehand, but um, it's a gorgeous book. Really, really nice. And um, I love all the stories. I had a proper read of it during the week and it's just lovely. Um, my friend Nadia Seaver from the Cottage Notebook pod podcast um, wrote this beautiful um, kind of essays intermingled and pieces of prose intermingled between what the designers thought about um, their own particular their own pieces and what they were inspired by to create the pieces and they're absolutely gorgeous but I might do a separate interview a separate kind of uh, book review on that because it's getting a bit long so I love you all so much I hope 
that you have a wonderful week. I know this is odd on a Tuesday, but I never said that I was only going to film videos on Sundays and Saturdays and release them at the weekend. So this is a little midweek surprise for you. Uh, I hope you have a lovely day. The storms have blown themselves out maybe from yesterday, although I think we're still due to get some stormy weather. But I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all the love. If you want to, um, you can like the video by clicking the thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Just pop that little subscribe button and I'll pop up in your video and you'll be able to find me again quite easily if you don't remember my name or anything like that. Um, you can also click the little button beside the subscribe video. You might need to do this on an iPad or on a computer, but there's a little after you click subscribe, I think, there's a little bell that pops up. Um, I think it's down this side, little bell. So there's a little bell that pops up just down beside the subscribe button. And if you click on that, then you'll get notifications to your phone whenever I pop up, if you want to really keep in contact with me. <laughs> and that would be like crazy awesome. Someone told me in the comments last time, um, that uh, they did that uh, like I was one of their people that they put notifications on and I was just like Aah! that's the sound I made so that's if you want me to make that sound then just click that little button and I'll be like Aah! so nice okay I'll talk to you later bye